so your uh, updated edition of the ethics of abortion was recently number one on Amazon. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Can you uh, tell us about the book and um, what are readers going to find in the updated edition? Yeah, so there's quite a bit actually that's new in the updated ed edition. So what I've done is take into account the way the argument has evolved and changed over the course of the last seven years or so. And one of the biggest changes, of course, is the Dobbs decision, mm -hmm. which overturned Roe. So that is uh, you know, mentioned in the book, but really the book is more focused on the scholarly arguments that were um, you know, in the literature for the last seven, eight years. And so there's a bunch of different ones, but the two maybe that I want to focus on is one, um, some new arguments about the use of artificial uteruses. So there has been a discussion in the literature about whether the abortion debate could be um, uh, solved, as it were, by the use of artificial uteruses. And the basic idea would be that the pro-choice side would be uh, happy that a woman who didn't want to be pregnant would no longer be pregnant. And then the pro-life side would be happy that the human being in utero isn't killed, but rather moved into a early incubation, uh, you know, what would you call it, uh, like an intensive care unit. And so it would seem, at least on the face of it, that both sides would be happy. So, uh, but it turns out not everyone is happy with that solution. And so I, in the in the third edition, take on the view of uh, some people that uh, parents have a right to end the life of the uh, young human being, even if it's outside of anyone's body in an artificial uterus. So anyway, I look at that article or that argument. Um, and I look at some other empirical evidence about women who have uh, fetal complications such that the baby is doomed to die. So there are these cases where they can diagnose prenatally that there's some condition the child has that makes it incompatible with life. And then the idea that some people have is it's very compassionate to do an abortion in this situation. And the empirical evidence I looked at, cited from five different studies, uh, all came to the same conclusion that women who carry the pregnancy to term and gave birth actually did not regret doing that, that they actually were very uh, satisfied uh, despite the tragedy of the situation that they had continued the pregnancy and moved forward. So that's the kind of thing where if a woman's gonna give informed consent, that it seems like that's a relevant consideration that should be brought into the mix. So there's a bunch of other things that I talk about in there, but I'd say those are two that I just want to highlight now. Yeah, absolutely. I wish we had time to dive into to each one of those here today. Um, in the book, you do address a number of arguments in favor of abortion to a particular limits, such as viability, birth, sentience. I mean, you explain why each of these fails. I'm curious to know which of these arguments you believe is the strongest, and if you could share with us how that also uh, fails to justify abortion. So what is the strongest of those arguments? Um, I actually think they're all pr really pretty weak. Um, so it's sort of hard to say who's the strongest. It'd be like, well, who's the strongest kindergartner? Well, there's probably one that's kind of strong, but kindergartners are really weak in general, so there's not really any that's that strong. I guess the strongest would be this. If you're a utilitarian, then you would hold that sentience, the ability to experience pain, is the morally relevant characteristic for assessing any kind of action. And so if you are a utilitarian, uh, that would be the strongest one. Um, I think that's a problematic one for a number of reasons. Uh, a, and I guess most importantly, I'm not a utilitarian. I think that's a very bad way to think about ethical issues and just issues in general. Uh, but B, there are cases of human beings that have chronic insensitivity to pain syndrome. So for those human beings, even after they're born, they can't experience any physical suffering. So cut off their finger, it'd be like you getting a haircut. It doesn't bother them at all. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, appealing to pain also doesn't doesn't work very well. But but I suppose among all the different ones that people put forward, that might be the... Um, the strongest of the weakest, if I could say that. 